Okay, I'll do a quick sound check. Can you give me a thumbs up on Discord if that volume is okay for you? Ah, loud and clear. Thank you, Emma. I was getting worried there that my microphone wasn't working for some reason. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. So it's um, almost time and we'll get started. Um, so this week, um, we're going to finish off talking about functions, which we started on Monday. And as per um, usual, we'll have the question and answers chat on Discord. And Steve is running that today for us. Okay, so the story so far, we have so far in Eng1003, we've talked about different kinds of variables and data types in Python. Then we talked about arrays, which is a, a vector of um, more than one elements of data that we might want to work with. And we've used a library package NumPy in order to work with those arrays. We've done some plotting via matplotlib, another library that's very useful in this course. And then last week we did some flow control. So some if statements, some while statements, some for statements. So how do we get our program to do different things depending on situations as they arise in real time? And then on Monday, we started to talk about functions. How can we break up our program into smaller pieces to make it a bit more manageable? Today, we're going to put two of those things together. We're going to put arrays and functions together. Last week, we did some functions, but we only passed in scalars, so a single value, an integer or a float, one at a time. Now, we're going to talk about how we can use functions with arrays, and we're going to add in some flow control too. All right, so first example. We're going to do a function where we simply access array. So we're going to send an array into the function and we're going to process it in some way and return uh, some values that depend on the array. So what, what this program is going to do is I'm going to give it an array and it's going to calculate the minimum value in that array, the maximum value, and it's going to calculate the av average of all of the values in the array. So that's the task I've been assigned as a programmer. So let's start off with some design decisions. So first of all, we have to give it a name. So I'm going to call it array stats because I guess the minimum, maximum and an average is some pretty simple statistics to calculate for my array. Um, the argument, uh, I'm going to be passing in my array x. That's the only thing we need uh, in order to do this function. And the return values are specified in the question. So the minimum value, the maximum value, and the average value. And I'm going to do that step by step live now in um, PyCharm. Uh, why can't I escape out of this? OK, so let me put this into full screen view. And we'll start working our way through this problem step by step rather than trying to solve it all at the same time in one go. So first up, this, this is a problem that is about arrays. So the first thing we need to do um, is to check to see if we can if we can work with arrays. So let's go. Now in eng1003, we know that we're going to be using numpy anytime that we're dealing with arrays. So the first thing we need to do is to import the numpy library. So I'll type that one in. Okay, so I'm going to need NumPy. Now let's create some arrays. So we've seen three uh, different ways to create arrays so far in this course. Um, all of them use NumPy. Uh, we've seen Linspace, um, where we can create sort of an array with linear values that are linearly, linearly spaced. So let's do that one. So we would write X, I'll call my array X. x is equal to np dot linspace. And then we know with linspace, we need to give it three values, the start value, the end value, and then how many values we need in between. So this um, 
num NumPy lin space function is one way that we can create a little toy or array that we can use to test our program. And I'll just print that out so that we can see what that array is going to look like. So another function that we've used in eng1003 to create an array is a zeros function. So we can create an array full of zeros. Again, we're using a function inside NumPy. So we have to write NP because we've imported NumPy as NP and zeros. And now we just need for the function zeros, we just need to we just need to tell the function how many zeros we require in our array. So I'm going to say 10. And let's have a look at that array just to make sure that, that we are doing what we think we're going to do. OK, so now I will. Ah, and then the final one I want to talk about is how do we create a toy array when we know the values that we want to initialize the array with? And that's probably going to be most useful to us here today. Um, so that we can control some, some values in our array. So I'm just going to make these up. It doesn't really matter what values they are. So 1.5, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5. Let's go 78 and minus 1, for example. So that's another way we can create a toy array that we can use when we're practicing our functions. So step one, verify that we can create arrays and we can look at arrays. So let's um, let's do that. Oops, what have I done wrong? Ah, I beg your pardon. I have typed the wrong function. What I really wanted was npy.array. It completed it for me and I didn't check. So let's run that. Um, come on, window. Excellent. So now I've confirmed that these are all three valid ways I can create a little toy array I can use for the rest of this, this function design. So the, the lin space creates values from naught to nine and, and places equally spaced values in between. The zeros function will just give me an array of zeros if that's what I want. And the np.array function will give me an array um, with the values that I've specified. So I'm going to use the second one. OK, so step one, we've confirmed that we can create an array. Now, what do I need to do with this array? I need to find the minimum value, the maximum value, and the average. So let's test those one at a time to see how we can go calculating those things. I mean, this is even before I write the function because I'm doing it step by step and building up as I go. So, so to access all of the values in the loop and find the minimum value, all of the values in the array and find the minimum, minimum value, a good way to do that is a loop. In this particular case, we know how many values there are in an array. So we know how many times the loop is going to need to run before we start, which means a for loop is probably a pretty good option for us. So let's figure out what we need to know. First of all, we need to know what the length of the array is. And I'm not going to hard code that in and write, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, because I want my code to work if I change my example array. So first of all, Let's figure out what the how many elements there are in the array. Now, I can do a for loop now and loop over all of those elements so I could look for the smallest one. I'll use i as the index for the loop, it doesn't matter. And I'll use my range function to specify what values I want um, those i's to do. So I'm going to loop over all of the values in my array from naught to n. Okay, so I'm going to check all of the values one at a time. And my array is x, so I'm going to check xi. So what do I need to do with this xi? I need to see if it's the minimum value. So what I probably need to do is to start off, actually, by deciding, by initializing a choice of, an, of minimum value so I can now compare the current element in the loop to that minimum. So let's what would be a good thing to initialize our minimum value to? We could pick an arbitrary value like zero if we knew that the array was always positive. Um, but perhaps if, um, I'm sorry, if the array was always negative, but perhaps if we make a choice and then the array changes, we might end up 
having a default minimum value that doesn't actually work, that's actually smaller than everything that's actually in the array. So what we should do instead is let's initialize the minimum value to be the first value in the array. Okay, so I'm going to say my minimum value is the first value in the array. Now I'm going to check every other um, value in the array to see if it's smaller than this or not. So let's check every other value in the array. So if the current value is less than the minimum value, then the current value should become the minimum value because it is smaller. I need the colon for the if statement. Uh, so initialize the minimum value, check through to see if the current value is less than the minimum value, let's, let's update our minimum value. Now I probably don't need to start with the zero element in the array because I've already checked it here by assigning it to the minimum value as a first step. So I can probably loop through from the value, the one index up until the n minus one index, remembering that range goes from the first value to, to one minus the second value. Okay, so is that gonna work? I've set my default minimum value as the first element in the array. I've checked every other element in the array. And if it's smaller than that minimum, I will make it the new minimum and then keep checking. So I think that's probably all I need to do. And I can print out the minimum value just to check to make sure I'm right. So as I'm, as I'm going through and testing my code in this process, I'm going to do some print statements that are just going to be not very well formatted. And that's okay, because this is part of the debugging process. I'm just going to keep printing stuff to the screen to check if it's right. When I'm finished at the end, um, when I know everything's well, working well, then I'll go and I'll spend some time doing some good formatting for my print statements when I'm ready to hand over my final function to the end user. Alrighty, so let's run this one. Okay, so it's gone through all the values in the array and it's found that the minimum value is negative one. Perfect. Worked as expected. Now I've done defined arrays, found the minimum value. Let's check if I can find the maximum value, which actually should be pretty um, easy to do because it's very similar to what we've just done. So instead of um, setting the maximum value, setting the minimum value, I'm going to instead search for the maximum value. Um, and yes, I could do it all within the one loop, but I'm doing it separately one step at a time now, and then I'll bring them all together into a single loop later. So again, because I know exactly how many elements I need to search over, a, a for loop is probably a good choice. So I'm going to loop over all of the elements in the array. Now this time, if the current value, the ith index, is bigger than the maximum value, that's when I need to update my maximum value. If it's smaller than the maximum value, I don't need to worry about it. I don't actually need to do anything. OK, so let's work through that. Initialize the maximum value as the first value in the array, search every through every other value. And if I find one that's greater than the current max, I need to update it. So let's do that. And again, each step, I'm gonna check that it's working. Excellent, so it, found that the maximum value is 78, which it is. Excellent. So the last thing I needed to be able to do is to find the average, the mean of all the values in the array. So again, because I need to, do, to what I will need to do is to add up all of the values and then divide by the number of values they are, because that's how you calculate the mean, sum of all values divided by the number of values. So to do the sum of all values, I can use a for loop again. So I will start off this time, I'll initialize the sum to the first value. Then I will loop again over all the other values. And this time I will add each value to my running sum. Okay. 
Okay. Then to calculate the average, it's just going to be my running sum, which I'll have after the loop is finished, divided by the number of elements, which I already know is n, because I've calculated the length of that array earlier up. And then let's print out my average. Okie dokie. Let's see if this one works now. Okay, so it tells me my average value is 13. That looks about right to me because this outlier 78 is, is pulling the average a bit above the medium. Correct, let me know if I'm wrong, but I think that means my Python code is, is working okay. So now I've tested all of the three individual steps that I needed to do um, to solve this problem. Um, so let's um, put it all together. First thing I'm gonna do, now I should just say here, I could have initialized the sum to zero and then looped over for i in range zero to n and, and not needed um, to initialize the sum as the first element in the array. But there's a good reason I did it this way so that I can have the same loop for all three parts of the task and combine them together. So let's do that. So I'm gonna have, um, I'm gonna make my first one loop that's gonna do everything. So I'll use this loop up here because it's already working for the minimum, but I'll ask it to also do the maximum. So I have to initialize the maximum and the sum. Let's make sure I have the right variable names. So I've initialized all of them and I'll use one loop now to calculate all of my minimum, maximum and average. So if x, i is greater than my current max. Okay, and finally my sum. Okie dokie, and so I'll print, I'll print all three out. It'll be a bit messy, but um, I'm not gonna worry about that at the moment. Min x, max x, and my average, which is sum on n. All right. So I'll just get rid of this code that I don't need anymore. So what I've really done here is taken those three individual tasks that I checked one at a time to make sure that I knew what I was doing with each of them. And once I confirmed that they worked one at a time, I've joined them all in together into one loop to be a little bit more efficient in my code. So I think the indenting all looks okay there. So let's run it and see if there are any unexpected errors. There are, so what happened here? Line 16, sum equals sum. Oh, oh, I've got the wrong variable name. It's not sum, it's sum x. Okay, I called it sum x, not sum. So let's run that again. Okie dokie, so it's got the minimum, the maximum and the average. It's a bit of a mess, but let's worry about that later. So now I've confirmed I've done all the tasks I needed to do. Let's put them into a function now. So this is the, this is the key body of what I need to do. I'll just see if I can move that down. So let's turn it into a function. Um, so we need a def to say that a function's coming. We need the name of the function, which I think we said was gonna be array stats. And we need the parameters that this function needs to do its job. And this particular function just needs the array x. Now we need to do proper indenting. So I'm just gonna use a tab to make sure that all of these initialization steps get done within the loop, are done within the function. And then within the function, after I've done all of the initialization steps, I'm going to calculate the minimum, the maximum, um, and the sum. 
Okay, does that look all right? Let's see. Passed in X, I have to find some variables, some local variables in the function, which are n, min x, max x and sum. I've done the calculations that I already proved works. Oh, sorry, that sum x should be inside the loop. Got to get the indenting right. Now, the last step I need to do is to calculate the average, which we know is the sum of all of the x's divided by the number of x's, which I, is a variable inside my definition because it's up here. And last but not least, I need to be able to return those values back to uh, the main code, which is going to call this function. So I need a return statement to tell the function what it needs to return and in what order. So it's going to return min x, then max x, and then average x. Okay, so let's see now if we can call this function. So it's got three return values and I just type them all out with commas. Now they don't have to have the same name. So let me give you an example where it's got a different name. So the, the variables that we're going to store the return values to don't have to have the same name as what the variables were called inside the function. They can be completely different. It's just helpful sometimes to have the same name because uh, it helps you figure out what's going on. But I'm going to give you an example by calling the third return variable mean x to show you that it's still going to work. Now my function name was array stats and I need to pass in X. So let's put the function definition up the top and then the function call down the bottom. So I'm going to define my function X. Let's print it out. Then let's call, uh, sorry, define my um, array X. Let's print it out. Use my function array stats to calculate the minimum, um, the maximum and the mean of X. And then I'm going to print it out. So I'm going to print out just to make sure everything is still working. My minimum, my maximum and my average or mean. Okie dokie. And there we go. So same numbers as before, which is excellent. The answer shouldn't change just because I've moved my code into a function. So that's looking that's looking like I have a working function that's do, doing what I need. So why don't we do a, have a sanity check and I'll put in something where I know what the average is just to double check that those numbers are right. So let's go five, five, five or four, five, six. Let's make it not so simple. Um, so another array, let's calculate my statistics for that array, x2, and then let's print them out. Okay, so I'm doing just calling the same function I've already defined, but I'm going to pass in a different array, so I should get a different answer. Okay, fantastic. So minimum four, maximum six, average five. Beautiful. Now I'm happy everything's working. So let's um, fix my presentation up a little bit now. So um, let's see, what should I type? The array X has minimum, one minimum, maximum and average has minimum, let's use an equal, has minimum equal to that, maximum equal to that, and average equal to that. Okay, so what are those brackets need to, what variables do those brackets need to be replaced with? The first one is X, my array. The second one is the minimum, the maximum, and then the average, perfect. Now, because I know that some of those ver this this average variable has got a lot of decimal places, it looks a bit not so great. Let me put some formatting in. I'll give it three decimal places. Let's see. Um, so it looks a little bit better. Let's see, final test. 
Okay, so the array X has minimum minus one, maximum 78 and average 13.214. Excellent. So we have now achieved the task, which was to write in a function which takes an array an array um, x and, and calculates some simple statistics of it. Um, I'll go back to the slides. Um, okay. So a couple of things I want to talk about um, here now, moving on to, so what we've just seen is a function which takes in an array and, and uses it, but doesn't change it in any way. Um, so now we're going to move on next to a function which takes in an array and changes it, um, modifies some of the values in the array, that it needs to return a modified array to the main function. And this is where it gets a little bit um, technically a little bit dif different from what we saw on Monday, because on Monday when we saw if we passed in a, ver a scalar variable like an integer or a float, um, we said um, what happens in the function stays in the function. So if you pass in, so a variable x, so x equals three, what's being passed into the function is the value of three, the number three. And within the function, a new variable will be created to hold that number. So if we change it in any way, it won't be changed when we return back to the main function. Now that's with a scalar. With an array, it's actually the opposite story. So technically, when you pass an array to a function, as we just did before in the previous example, when we passed in X, we are not passing in a copy of the array. What we're actually pointing in is a memory address, which tells the function where in memory to go and find the array. And because we're passing in a memory address to the array, the function has got the actual ar array. So when it goes to look at an element of that array X, it's looking at the original memory address where the main program that we just called the function from has stored that array. So if we change any of the elements in that array, um, even if we don't return that explicitly return that array back to the main function, it will stay changed. So it's the opposite of what happens with a scalar. And that's going to be important when we now write functions which modify an array. So because arrays are passed by a pointer, a pointer being an address to memory where the array is stored, the function gets the actual array. Okay, so when we access the array in memory, the original array element is accessed or changed. So modifying an array inside a function modifies the original array. So you'll see that change outside the function as well. And one of the consequences is this, of that is that you don't need a return value if you're returning an array. Um, in a technically incorrect um, manner, all the array's elements are returned um, without you explicitly having to do so. So it's something to be very careful of um, when you're writing Python codes that use arrays and um, other objects as well. But in this course, we're just concerned with arrays. Okay, so let's do that. Let's write a function live, which we're going to pass in an array. And then we're going to look for any negative values in that array. And if it's a negative value is found, we're going to replace it with a zero. So we're removing any negative values in an array. Uh, and then the second step is we're going to create a new copy of an array, which keeps the positive values in X and has zeros in places of the negative values. So we're going to keep our original X and then create a new array Y, which is a zeroed version of X. And so two slightly different tasks. Let's see that in some Python code. Oh, okay. Wait a second. So I'll keep my import statement because I am still working with arrays. And I'll keep my um, line here where I'm going to define a toy array that I'm going to use to test out my function. But let's put some a few more negative values in my array because those are going to be important for this new function that I'm that I'm defining. So I'm going to define an array using NumPy, of course, again, um, and it's going to be this array here. A few positive, a few negative values. I don't need to calculate some stats anymore. So let's start from the beginning. Alrighty, so I've calculated my array X. Let's print it out. 
just to make sure that my array is what I think it is. Okay, great. Got my array. Now, what I want to do in my function is go through every element of the array, check and see if it's negative, and if it's negative, replace it with zero. So another uh, good use case for a for loop here. So first of all, what is, let's figure out what the length of my array is. Then let's do a for loop. I'll use i as my loop index. And I'll loop over all of the, the entries in the array this time. Now I need to check each entry and check if it's negative. So if this entry is negative or less than zero, it's the same way of saying negative, then I need to set it to zero. Otherwise, I can just leave it as it is. Okay, so there's my first step. I'm doing this outside of a function now. I'm just proving that I can get the maths right before I worry about writing my function. So loop over every value in the array, check if it's negative, and if it is, set it to zero. So let's see if that worked. Okay, so there was the array that I started with, and then my for loop did correctly go through and turn all of the negative values to zero. Perfect, what I needed. Now let's, let's turn this into a function. So I need my definition. I need the name of my function. Um, let's call it positive array. Because I want to make my array positive. And the input to my function is going to be the array. Okay, now I can take this code that I already just wrote and tested and put it up. No, I can't. I will have to write it out again. Um, so I find its length, then I have to do a for loop. Okie dokie, so there's my function. Now, I'm not going to do a return value here. And I'm not going to do a return value because I'm going to show how an array can be changed and that change is going to be consistent in the main program even if I don't return anything. But let's have a look. So here's, so in, so my function's done. I'm pretty sure that's going to work because I already tested that all the maths inside it was correct. Now I'm just testing the passing of, of the array into the function and out again part of the problem. So here's my array that I've created. Let's print it out. Now let's change it using my positive array function that I just created. Uh, yep, and then let's print it out again just to make sure that between this step and this step, my array did change as I've been claiming that it would. So there you go. So here's the original array, which was printed out here before I called the function. And here's the array printed out after I called the function. So even though I didn't have any return statement from this function, that array X has still been changed. Now, I can put in a return function if I want, so I can just return nothing as well. Um, that will have the same effect. So you don't need that return statement in Python. I like to use it because in any other coding language I've ever programmed in, there's always something to signal, <laughs> signal the end of a, a function, but you don't need it. Um, Okie dokie. So, what I want to highlight now is how this is different, supposing that I had a scalar. So let me create a new function, which is going to do exactly the same thing as this function, but for a scalar. 
So a scalar just being a single value. And we'll pass in, let's call it A. And we'll say, if A is negative, let's make it zero. Let's assign it to be the value zero. Okay, and then I'm gonna leave off the return statement, just like I did when I was dealing with arrays, and let's see what happens. So let's create a scalar, let's make it minus 10. Let's print it out, see what it is before I call my function. Let's call my positive scalar function. Pass in A and then print it out to see what happened to A after I called my function. So you'll probably remember from last week what's going to happen to A, but I just want to show the contrast here between arrays and scalars. So exactly the same looking function, I passed in something, I altered it inside the function and I didn't return it. So in both cases, I've done pretty much exactly the same thing, but the outcome is very different depending on whether that something was an array or whether that something was just um, this um, integer minus 10. Or it also will work with the float as well, same thing, but let's run that. So even though I changed A within this function, when A is a float, it didn't uh, change outside the function. To have it change outside the function, I need to explicitly return it. I need to explicitly return it and then I need to make sure my variable A gets the new returned value. So I'm passing in my variable A when it's minus 10 and I'm replacing my variable A with the new returned value. So now the function should do what I want it to do on this scalar. There you go. So it got in minus 10 and it had a return value of zero, which is exactly what we were hoping it would do. Um, and that's the difference between passing arrays into um, functions and passing scalars into functions. Now, the second part of the problem, and I'll get rid of that scalar example because we don't need that anymore. And we'll move on to the second part of my problem. So the second part of my problem was, I want to keep my original array X, but I do want to create a new array Y that's the same as X, except that it has zero in all of the negative places. And we saw how to do that um, two weeks ago, I think, when Steve showed you the, the copy function. So we can create our new array Y. Um, and we explicitly create a copy of it. Because remember from last week, if I just do this, let's try this out. Array X, new array Y, then I'm going to change Y. So I'll print X. I'll print y, I'll change y using the function I already um, wrote before, and then I'll print out x and I will print out y. So let's see what happens here. So x and y are the same, but they're not just the same numbers, they're exactly the same arrays pointing to exactly the same space in memory. So when I changed Y, that's fine. Y changed as it should have, but also so did X. And that's because this line here is not doing what you think it's doing. It's not creating a new copy Y of the array X. It's actually creating a pointer to exactly the same array in memory. So that's why when we changed array, uh, when we changed y, x actually changed. So I need to use my proper um, copy function. So I think that is np.copy. Okay, so this time I've used an explicit copy function so that y becomes a different array. It has the same values as x, but it's a completely separate, different copy of x in a different part of the memory of my computer. And now when I do this and I pass in y and y is changed by my function positive array, x should not be changed as well, because I'm just changing a y, which is a new array, which is not the same as the array x this time. 
Okay, so there we go. Did that work? Yes, worked beautifully. So X and Y were the same to begin with before the function, but then when I changed Y, only Y changed and X stayed the same. So this is how I can do the second part of my problem, which actually uses the same function, but um, returns um, two, two um, different arrays because I created two different arrays before I started that function. Another potential thing you could do is um, explicitly write your function in a way so that it returns an array. Now this is um, up to you whether you want to leave it like that or do it we'll do it um, the way I'm going to show you at the moment. I do like to do it this way, but it's probably a hangover from um, the different, the other coding languages I'm, I'm used to. So I could explicitly return X just to highlight the fact that something's being changed. And then I could um, explicitly write like this and let's see. Um, so X is the variable name inside the function, Y is the variable name outside the function. There you go. So nothing actually changed in terms of what was done, but in terms of looking through the main code and trying to figure out as you're scrolling through the code, not necessarily having just written it, um, it's more obvious to you from this line that you've actually changed that array Y and you're going to be return and it's going to be a little bit different. Or the other thing you could do within this function is to actually do the copy within here. So let's pass in, let's call it x1. And then we can do x equals So in this case, I'm still solving question two, but I'm doing the array copy inside the function. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll print X as well. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do this copy step inside the function. So the function returns Y, which is the copy of um, X1, which has then been zeroed out. So let's have a look at that one. Okay, so X is our original array. After we've done the function, X is still our original array, but we now have this new copy Y, which is a copy of, of X, which has been zeroed out. That's another way you could solve the same problem that might be a little bit easier to, to follow uh, in your main code if this is part of a bigger program. Alrighty, so there's a lot of uh, coding examples in today's lecture, but I really wanted to stress the two different ways um, you can think about a functions. One to, to just access an array and calculate something based on the array, and the other one to actually modify the array in some way as part of your function. So let's go to full screen mode. So we've done this, we've done this example. Um, and finally, um, if you remember on Monday, we wrote some code that calculates the ball height um, as a function of some parameters that we passed in, the initial velocity, the time and gravity. Now we can rewrite that function um, so that it now works with arrays instead of just with a single value of t as we saw on Monday. We're now gonna work, we're gonna calculate the height for a whole array of different values of t. So inside our main program, we're still going to set what the initial velocity is, but we're going to set our time t instead of being a single value to being an array of values. In this case, we'll use lin space because it makes sense for t to have a nice linear space sequence of, of times. And then we can calculate the ball height um, using a function ball height two, um, passing in the initial velocity and now the array of t inside the function, because we're using the NumPy library, inside the function, we can actually write down exactly the same mathematical expression as we had before when t was just a single number. Um, and it will work just as well when t is actually a NumPy array. And it calculates and it will return a vector y, where y has the answer. Each entry in that, that array y will be the answer for each of the t's in the original array t. 
So you might say, what have we actually done differently? That looks very much like the function that we already defined last week. And that is absolutely true. There is actually nothing different. The function definition and even the function call is exactly the same from last week when we were using a scalar t to this week when we're using a vector t. The only difference is that we have to include NumPy because we're using NumPy arrays to create our vectors. And we, when we created t, we didn't just assign it to be 0.6, we assigned it to be an array of numbers. Um, and you might say, well, that's really great. I can just write functions and it's doing the same thing. But the problem here, of course, is that Python is hiding a lot from us. Um, there's a lot being hidden here in the way that it's dealing with arrays compared to the way that it's being dealing with scalars. And that is quite unique to Python. In most other languages, if you write a function like this, you have to be absolutely clear about whether you're passing in a pointer to array or whether you're passing in a scalar um, in, in a number of different places in your code. So the fact that Python hides it from you so that you can write exactly the same function and not need to, once you've imported the, the NumPy library, of course, means that your code is easy to read and easy to write. And But the disadvantage um, is it's very easy to write code which is not doing what you think it is doing. Um, and if you, if you want any evidence of that, just take a quick look through the Discord chats when we first started introducing, and introducing arrays. And it's very easy to, to start getting things wrong when you get confused about whether you're dealing with an array or whether you're dealing with a scalar. So even though Python through NumPy allows you to use it interchangeably, as a programmer, you still need to think very carefully about what you're writing functions for, whether you're passing in scalars or arrays, and what that means in terms of, of return values, what that means in terms of whether something that happens in the function changes something outside the function. And what that happens if you try and assign a single value to an array, for example, or assign an array to something that was previously a single value. So that's what I want your take home message to be from today is to, uh, when you're writing functions or indeed when you're programming Python altogether, think very carefully about what's happening when you're actually using an array. All right. So you might be saying, oh, this is all well and good, Sarah, but when, when should we actually use functions? Um, so the answer to that is to think about, well, what do they actually achieve? Um, it's much easier to solve problems when they're broken down into subtasks. Um, so maybe in your bigger program, you have one task that needs to zero out the negative values of the array. And then after you've done that, you need to calculate the minimum, the maximum um, and the average. So that's a, that bigger problem would be much easier solved by writing one function to zero out and then one function to calculate the stats and then calling them one at a time when you need them, for example. Um, they, if you have a function, it reduces the line count because you can just define the maths once for the function uh, and then you can call it in a single line multiple times. So my array stats function, I can define it once and then every time I get in a new array and I want to calculate its mean, its minimum, its maximum and its average, I can just call that function once rather than having to type out the loop and, and, and doing all of that work again every time. It also allows codes to be reused between projects. You know, if you've got my ball height code that I've already written um, in week, week two for arrays and then I needed it again in another project that needed to calculate a ball height, I can just copy that function across um, and be, be confident that it's a self-contained unit that's going to work as long as I you know, pass in the right arguments. Uh, it's much easier if you've got multiple programmers working on the same problem because you can assign each one's separate independent functions and they can work away on that function uh, without having to have too much interaction between each other. You just tell them ahead of, you tell each um, programmer ahead of time, your function takes in A, B and C and returns D and then they can go away and they can call their variables whatever they like inside the function. And it's not going to interfere with what someone else is doing in the main code or what someone else is doing in another function. And um, when you're debugging, it's easier to fix bugs in a function. Um, rather than trying to find a bug in a piece of code that you've cut and pasted multiple times in, in, in lots of different places in your, in your bigger program. And I'm sure there are many others. Um, what about in Eng1003? Um, so taking Brenton's um, rule of thumb, he says more than 10 to 20 lines or so in your code, break it up into functions. Um, 
If you've got a bigger problem, even if it's fewer than 10 to 20 lines of codes, it's a nice idea to break it into sub problems, sub problems that make sense. Um, even if even if you're only going to call something once, um, still breaking it up into a function can be useful for code readability. Um, and your opinion on when and how and why you need functions and when to use them will change with experience. And of course, if you're asked to do it an assessment task in Eng1003, then that's also a good reason to use a function, even if none of the other rules apply. Um, so we've pretty much covered uh, chapter four of the textbook this week. Um, so if you want more practice, have a go through all of the exercises in section 4.3 of the textbook to get some more familiarity with both functions and passing arrays into functions. Okay, so now a couple of extra slides because I know some of you are feeling a little bit um, anxious about the assessment tasks that we've had and we will have in ENG1003. So all of this information has actually already been posted either on Discord or on um, uh, Blackboard emails, but I'm putting it all together in one spot because it can't hurt to be told um, a couple of different ways. So the assess lab that you all did last week all of the results for everybody who's been assessed should be up now on Blackboard. Um, please take a look and make sure your mark is there um, because it's a very large class. So it's very easy to miss some marks or have some typos or somehow, somehow not getting what you, you should get. So now is the time to check. In fact, after every assessment task, um, once we let you know that the marks are up, it's always good to check because it's much easier to fix something now for your week four task and it will be in week 13 when memories have faded. If you have a check and you find out that the mark is not what you expect or there's no mark at all and you know you did the assess lab, please on Discord send a private message to Steve and let him know the details, what your name is, what class you're in, what session, what room. And if you, and if you know it, the name of the, the demonstrator who marked you. Now, a few of you have put in adverse circumstances requests for that lab. Those are still being processed, don't panic. Um, someone should be in touch um, by the end of next week. Okay, so now moving on from the past assessment task to the new assessment task, um, next week, during this lecture slot time, there will be a quiz. Um, we won't have the Zoom and we or the YouTube uh, web, the Zoom webinar or the YouTube stream will not be on. So there won't be one of these next week. Instead, what you will need to do is log on to Blackboard. And at the time that the quiz will start, it will become available on Blackboard. So it's going to be a Blackboard quiz. So the questions will pop up on Blackboard and you will submit your answers through Blackboard. Now it's an open book quiz. So you can have your lecture notes, you can have the textbook, you can have your lab code that you've already written uh, in the lab so far, all available to you while you do this quiz. However, what you cannot do is ask other people to help for help, whether that's another person in the room or whether that's on the Discord channel or any other sort of online forum where you post a question and ask for ask for solutions. That is that is not allowed in the quiz. But if you have something, you know, hard copy or soft copy that was already written and existed before the quiz started, you can feel free to use that as a reference material. Um, so the quiz is covering everything that we've presented in weeks one to four of the lectures. So it is not covering functions, which we, which we have presented this week in week five. Um, so functions are not covered, but everything else from prior weeks is. Um, and everything that you've done in the labs, weeks one to five are covered in the quiz. And it counts towards 15% of your overall course grade in ENG1003. Um, so what's going to happen, you're going to be asked to solve a small number of problems by reading and or writing Python code. And once you've written, once you've got your answer ready to go, you will upload it into Blackboard and we will assess it um, at a later date. It won't be assessed live. So what I would suggest is if you have a question that asks you to write some Python code, it's probably a fan, not compulsory, but it's a fantastic idea if you wanted to cut and paste that Python code into PyCharm or into one of the online um, web interpreters, just to check that your code actually runs. So it's a good debugging step um, before you submit your final solution to check that the solution actually does what you think it does. Um, 
as so long as you can do that, of course, within the time limit of the quiz. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you, everyone. Finished with a couple of minutes to spare. Good luck with the quiz um, next week. And Steve will be back for the lecture on Monday.